What up everybody, Dylan with Magical Camps. In this month's DIY video, I'm gonna show everybody how I built this chameleon rack and the cages on it, and how I fit all the lighting and got this whole setup completed. So I know this video is an hour and some change, and I know that's really a lot of footage to watch. And I did consider separating this video into different parts so that, you know, certain people that were just looking for the cage uh, instructions or the rack instructions or the light instructions could just click on that. But then I thought about it and I was like, well, I figured it would make the most sense just to have it condensed in one long video. And what I'll do is in the description of the video, I'll go ahead and put times for each part that I'm doing. So if you are just looking to see how I built these enclosures, or you're just looking to see how I installed the misting system, you can go down to the description and there will be a time uh, for the video where I start that part of this project. So just to kind of give you a quick backstory on why I decided to go through all the trouble to build the rack and the cages and so on and so forth was because I want to raise my chameleons right. And what I mean by right is raising them individually so that bad things don't happen. Not that it will or would, but you know, I just noticed that when the chameleons are on their own in their own enclosure, they tend to do a lot better. So, so then the other thing was I could have used like the Rep Debris Nano or the Rep Debris Small, but I, in, in my experience, I just noticed that the Nano Breeze is very small and then the, the small Rep Debris is very large and there's in comparison. So there's no like in between. What I've done here is made enclosures in between. However, if you want to build a rack and then just use commercial cages, of course you could build the rack around the size of those commercial cages. I took into consideration that if I ever move, I wanna take this with me. So I made it the same height as the, uh, the typical door frame so that I could wheel it out and move it onto a moving truck or what have you. So I will say before we go into this video, watch it with an open mind and a creative mind. Just because I did screen enclosures doesn't mean you need to. You can use plexiglass, you can use some sort of clear vinyl instead of the screen. If you plan to do any sort of DIY rack or DIY cages or what have you, don't stress about the minute details and don't stress about being a perfectionist. The fact that you're making something is gonna make you feel awesome and it's gonna make you have something that everybody else will be jealous of. And you can even tell them, I made this. And that is such a great feeling to have. You know, and I know it might be discouraging seeing me use these crazy power tools, but honestly, I just picked those up a year ago and I just expanded my knowledge from Woodshop back in junior high school. So, it, you know, it's, it's a learning process and you gotta start somewhere. So if you, are discouraged don't be just pick up you know pick up a saw pick up a you know pick up some tools and just start somewhere this is a lot of fun and to see your reptile or your chameleon or what have you in something you built is such an amazing feeling so i'm not going to necessarily go into huge detail about how each of these tools work but i'll leave a link in the description for a great woodworking channel that can teach you all the stuff that i know so let's go ahead and get into the video. Alrighty, so the first thing I needed to do was build a custom rack. I've used the wire baker's racks and they work great. However, the wall that I plan to have this rack against is a very specific size, which they don't sell a baker's rack the size of. So I took matters into my own hands so that the rack would fit nicely on the wall and I would utilize that space to its maximum. Another benefit of doing a custom rack is that I am not limited to a particular size of cage. I can either work the rack around the commercially made cages or as you'll see in this video, I'm gonna make cages of my own that suit my needs. And you'll see here a little later when I construct these cages, you could honestly make the cages whatever size you prefer, whatever size works for you. But anyhow, 
I went ahead and went to the big box store and bought a bunch of pine two by fours, two by twos, and then I bought half inch plywood. Now I did get a little bit nicer plywood. I believe it was AB or BC plywood, which essentially means that it has one good side. So that way, whenever I put the paint job on, the part of the shelf that shows is gonna look nice. So I'll do my best to explain what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Uh, the first thing I need to do is build the sides, which is what the two by fours will be for. And then the two by twos will be used as supports for the plywood shelves. Now there's tons of ways to do this. I just found this the easiest and the cheapest since pine is the cheapest wood and plywood's pretty cheap. If you really wanted to go crazy and use something like walnut or oak, you totally could. But for something that's just gonna get beat up, with misters and such, I don't really see the point in spending too much money on it. So once I had all of my rack pieces cut to size according to my plans, I went and got a pocket hole jig. Now you don't have to use a pocket hole jig if this looks too intimidating to you. You could just use screws and screw everything together. However, if you take the time to learn how to use pocket holes, then you'll have a really structurally sound rack. Learning to pocket hole is something you can pick up pretty quickly. The kit will come with directions, however, I'm gonna to try to explain the best I can in this video. So this little kit comes with a blue jig, and essentially you adjust the markers within it to the corresponding size wood that you are going to be using then you'll clamp it to that lumber and go ahead and use the special drill bit it comes with and make sure that that collar too is adjusted to fit the wood size that you're using. And you'll bore out little holes in the sides of the wood for special pocket hole screws. By doing this, the orientation of the screws within the wood creates very, very strong connections between the pieces of wood stronger than, let's say, going in at a perpendicular fashion from the side of the wood. So once the jig is set up to drill into the wood that you're using, you then take those little lips of that jig, set them up against the side of the wood and clamp it down. Now you wanna make sure it's clamped down fairly tightly so that when drilling these holes, the jig won't shift. And then you'll see once I start drilling these holes in that that little collar, that little ring around the neck of the drill bit stops me from going too far into the wood. Now that you can visually see the holes that this pocket hole jig has made, you can kind of assess the way that the pocket hole screws will go into the wood, which they go in at about a 45 degree angle. And then when going to screw the pocket hole screws in, there's a special bit that the kit comes with, with a square head that allows you to screw the screws into the wood. Before you go crazy and just blast these pocket hole screws into the wood, you'll want to adjust the collar on the drill you're using to about a four or a five. And what this does is hinders the screw from blasting into the wood and damaging your project. By adjusting the collar on the drill, it's reducing the amount of tension required for the drill to stop pushing the screw into the wood. 
You'll notice this working when the drill starts to click and not screw in the screw anymore. After I finished making all of the pocket holes, I went ahead and grabbed my two by fours, which will be the outsides of this rack. And I went ahead and measured along the length of them where each of these two by two pieces of frame will screw in. Every rack will be different. I made sure that each one of these shelves would be the same height, taking into account the width of the two by two. And if you plan on using two by twos, they're actually perfect for recessed lighting and the UV fixtures. And you'll see that here in a moment. Once I had the two by fours marked, I went ahead and clamped the other pieces of the frame into place. I may have already said this, but I will say again that it is extraordinarily important that you have the two pieces of lumber clamped together when screwing in these pocket holes. What the screws will want to do is find the path of least resistance into the wood, which will shift it if not clamped properly. Once I had the 2x2s and the 2x4s screwed together for the sides of the rack, it was then time to put the 2x2s on that would act as the length of the rack. I took a tool that's called a combination square and lined it up on the side of the 2x4 with the 2x2s on the side. The reason for this is that when I screw on the lengths of this rack, I want them to be as even with those 2x2s two on the side. Once all the lines on the sides were drawn, I went ahead and got the 2x2s two that are going to be the length of the rack ready with some pocket hole holes. This last set of 2x2s two I'm pocket holding will go in the middle of each shelf to give it some extra stability and support. Then it got a little tricky. I couldn't just clamp the sides of the rack together with a regular clamp. I had to actually buy a special right angle clamp, which the company that makes the pocket hold jig and screws makes this type of clamp for this particular purpose. And you'll see here that this clamp has a smaller end that goes into one of the pocket holes to hold it together at a right angle with one of the sides. So I put all of the sides together 
reinforcement in the middle of each shelf. So I added a two by two in the middle of each shelf. Since this rack was so heavy and I still needed to move it around in order to sand it and do some other things to it, I decided to put casters on it now. Usually I would put casters on last, but this project was an exception. I flipped the rack upside down and then I found the center of those 2x4s and then I used a spade bit to drill out a long, large hole into those 2x4s so that I could add a T-nut and then screw in the casters. Now there's all kinds of different casters. There's some that just will screw on, which is really simple. These are just some extras that I had laying around, which involved me to spend no extra money on this project. So I would actually suggest just finding the kind that screw on instead of doing it this way, though this way works too. So once I had those holes drilled, I took what's called a T-nut and I hammered those in. Now be sure that if you're using casters that require T-nuts, that you find the corresponding T-nut size to the thread count of the casters. You're gonna find it very difficult to screw in your casters if they have a different thread count than your T-nuts. Also, make sure that the holes you're drilling are the same size as the widths of the thread of the T-nut, which should be indicated on the packaging of the T-nuts. Once the wheels were installed, I went ahead and flipped the rack back over and wheeled it over to a place where it could sit for a little bit, and then I filled the pocket holes. It isn't 100% necessary to fill the pocket holes, however, I just wanted to eliminate all possibilities of water damage on this rack. Do you realize that if you do this step, there will be no going back. You cannot take out the pocket hole screws after this. But anyway, the same company that makes the pocket hole jig and screws and clamps makes little plugs for the pocket holes, which you just install by using some wood glue. Alternatively, you could take a wooden dowel and glue it in the same way and then cut it flush with the rack sides. So going back a little bit to those T-nuts, they actually did not stay in since the rack was so heavy. When I was pushing around, they tended to wiggle a little bit. So I needed to make them absolutely permanent. And I did that by using some general purpose epoxy. To kind of help you understand why they didn't really work out where I had them was that in grain, which is where they were installed, is very weak and doesn't really grasp things very well. But anyway, after those were on and that epoxy went ahead and set, I went and sanded the entire project with 120 grit sandpaper. If it was a rough area, I used 90 grit and then followed that up with 120 grit. And after that, I wheeled it inside. And you can see here, the rack fit perfectly within the door frame, which is what it was designed to do. I then took the plywood, which I cut earlier, and placed it on top of the two by two shelf supports. I measured out on top of each shelf where I would need to screw in the plywood to the two by twos. I then took a tool called a countersink that essentially bores the surface of the wood to where the screw can sit beneath the surface of the wood. 
I then adjusted the countersink to the appropriate size for the screws I was using. For this project, I believe these were number eight one inch screws. So I made sure to use a number eight countersink so that the wood would not split due to the incorrect hole size. I then used some wood filler to conceal the head of each screw. And then I used a putty knife to make sure that that wood filler was flush and even with the surface of the wood. I also used wood filler in areas where there were either gaps or where the wood had splintered. I followed that up with a putty knife and once all that wood filler was dry, I used some 120 grit sandpaper to smooth everything out and make sure that it was as even as possible with the lumber. Next, it was time for a sweet paint job. Oh yeah. After letting the third coat of paint dry, I took measurements for my UVB fixtures. For this rack, I'm using T5 5.0 high output UVB bulbs. The hoods for these lights fit perfectly underneath each shelf. And this is a key factor to why I used two by twos for the shelf supports instead of something like a one by two. After taking my measurements, I used some outdoor graded mounting tape to mount the lights up in the top. Now, I wouldn't suggest using the mounting tape alone because in my experience, it tends to not hold very well. To give myself some extra security and solace to know that those lights weren't gonna fall, I used some perforated hanger strap, which is basically just an aluminum strap with some holes in it. I cut the appropriate length of this aluminum strap and used some stainless steel number eight half inch sheet metal screws. It's important to use stainless steel hardware for this type of project if you can, because with the amount of humidity and water that this rack will be exposed to, stainless steel is crucial because it will not rust. But anyway, I then took those screws and used number eight stainless steel washers and used those aluminum straps to mount the lights into the underside of each shelf. I will also suggest to use these straps on the ends of each light to where the light will still be able to be taken out and replaced if need be without having to completely unmount the light. I chose not to install any of the heat lights yet because I needed to see what the enclosures would look like on the rack once they were completed. I didn't want to have to go back in and adjust anything. Now it's time for the fun part, which is making the cages. The thing I'm using here is called a miter sled. And if you're going to make a large number of cages, I highly, highly recommend looking up how to build one. What the miter sled allows you to do is make multiple repetitive cuts very quickly and efficiently. So in other words, if you're doing a bunch of 12 and a half inch cuts, it will ensure that all the cuts are in fact the same length or 12 and a half inches. And you won't get any wonky sides that are uneven. But anyway, I went ahead and bought some aluminum screen framing and I just used a general purpose saw blade for this. Since it's aluminum and it's pretty thin, it doesn't require some expensive metal cutting blade. But I will tell you after cutting lots and lots of aluminum with a general purpose blade, it'll pretty much have seen better days. One last thing about this step is I highly recommend wearing some hand protection as well as some eye protection and face protection. Some of the aluminum shavings may fly at you, whether it's at your hands, at your face, or at your eyes, and you really don't wanna hurt yourself. So please be safe. If you're simply watching this video 
to learn how to build some chameleon cages out of aluminum framing, you could also use something like a hacksaw and just cut all the pieces by hand. Now it was time to start assembling the frames of the enclosures, which involves adding corners to each side. Now I highly recommend using Primeline brand corners because the kind that I found at Home Depot and Lowe's tended to slide out of the frame very easily, which made it really hard to put the screen in and keep the frame together. So if you're doing one cage, this will take you a few minutes, but if you're doing 24 cages like I am, this will take a long time. So what I ended up doing was watching a good show and getting comfortable on bed. This next thing isn't really necessary. It's just a jig I made that really, really made screening these enclosure sides very easy. Here's a little drawing of the wood before I cut it. And essentially what I'm trying to do is add sliders that will allow me to add the different size sides to this platform and use it as a foundation to add the screen to the sides. Again, I'm doing 24 cages. So to do 168 screens ended up being quite the process. So I needed something that made that a little easier. To make this jig for screening the aluminum frames, I'm using a Harbor Freight router table with a quarter inch straight bit. And you don't have to have a router table for this. You could use a drill and then follow up any holes with a saw and essentially any tools that you already have. You don't need to make a super beautiful piece out of this. All you're trying to do is create a tool that functions for the way you're trying to use it. And what I'm gonna do here is then insert these blocks with some screws and wing nuts uh, into the base of this jig. Now, if you can't quite figure out how I did this, I suggest trying to figure out something of your own. It just makes it really easy to screen the size of the enclosures when you have something to hold the screens in place while you screen them. Trying to do them on a floor or a table can be chaotic because the screen and the frame will want to slide around. The last part of this jig requires some stationary aspect in order to rest the aluminum frames up against. And for this, I'm just using some scrap one by twos and then screwing those in. I would suggest putting the one by twos on before you do the blocks because it was quite difficult to screw in the one by twos straight with the blocks already in there. You know, and I didn't do that here. And the reason being is that I got excited for this jig to be finished and didn't consider that I would be making my life more difficult by reversing those steps. Alrighty, it is now time to screen all of the aluminum frames that I made. So you can see here just how this jig works. The little blocks are loosened and then slid down or up the grid of the jig in order to hold different size aluminum frames in place. And then once the blocks are slid into place, they're tightened and then I just shift the jig according to what side of the frame that I'm screening. So the process of screening like this is not super difficult. I picked it up pretty quickly and it doesn't have to be super perfect. What I noticed with any of the imperfect screens that I did 
is that once I furnish the enclosures, I can't even really tell unless I look really hard at which screens came out with imperfections. So I suggest starting small if this is something that you wanna learn and then just build your way up from there. What I find to be the easiest technique in order to screen these aluminum frames is to make sure to cut a piece of screen that's not overly sized, that's you know relatively similar to the aluminum frame size that you're doing with a bit of overhang. I then get the spline rolling tool, that's the little tool I'm using right here, and I use the bigger part of the two ends to get the spline part way into the frame. And then once it's partially into the frame, I go back around and fully insert the spline. I find by doing it this way, I have a lot less tears in the screen and the screen tends to end up being taunt enough to where there's no wrinkles and it's not making the sides of the aluminum frame bow in. Again, it's kind of hard to explain just in words. It's something that you kind of need to do yourself to really get the feel for. I will say that it takes some patience to learn how to do this. And when you're in the process of screening these frames, don't go too quickly because what will happen is this little spline roller may slip into the middle of this screen and tear it. I can't tell you how many times that happened because I got impatient. So just go slow and do little bits at a time and don't be too forceful with the tool. Oh, and one more thing about this, I used some aluminum frame and you wanna make sure to use aluminum frame too so that crickets and other feeders can't chew through it. If you use something like fiberglass, the odds are that the feeders will chomp through it. And then on top of the aluminum frame, I used 1 8 inch or 0.125 inch spline. Once all of my frames were screened, I took a razor blade and trimmed all of the excess screen off. This is also something you want to be slow with so you don't accidentally slip and cut the middle of the screen that you just completed. Also, so you don't cut your hand. Uh, I also found that using a plain razor blade like I'm using ended up being, you know, pretty tedious and painful after a while on my fingers. So I recommend using something like a box cutter, which has a nice grip on it. Something else you may notice when trimming the screen is that the spline will want to come out a little bit, and that's no big deal. Just go ahead and use the spline roller to reinsert that screen and that spline into the frame. On some larger frames that I ended up screening for some cages on a future project, I found that using the spline roller to lightly groove the area where the spline would go before I actually inserted the spline made that process very easy. Honestly, there's probably hundreds of ways to do this. This is just what works for me. And you'll find something that works great for you too. But they're all finally. Next, it was time to give each one of these screens a nice paint job. So I just went ahead and used some Rust-Oleum 2X black spray paint. This is the Canyon Black, which is a satin finish. This process took forever because of the amount of screens I had to do. Another reason that it took a really long time is that some of this spray paint didn't want to dry along that spline for whatever reason. So I ended up having to wait extra time for it to cure and wiping off excess paint that didn't dry. Since I was already at a point where it didn't make sense to go back and redo things, 
I just worked with the cards I was dealt. Some other cages I made after this, I used some black aluminum screen instead of the silver like you see here. And I will say that I wish I had just done that to begin with on these smaller rack cages. The reason I didn't was because I thought I was saving money by spray painting them. However, the amount of spray paint that I had to buy was completely absurd and outlandish, and I would have never considered it would have taken as many cans of spray paint that it did to complete this project. So in the big picture, it really just would have made sense to get the black aluminum screen and use that from the get-go, and then just bought a few cans of spray paint and spray painted the aluminum frames before screening them. And one last thing, there is a little tool you can get that attaches to a can of spray paint or a can of finish or what have you, which is a little trigger that attaches to the can, which makes the process of spray painting a lot easier on your hands and your paint job will be a lot more even with the tool. I'll go ahead and link it in the description if you're interested. The next thing I'm doing here is making some door stops for the cages. If you've ever owned one of the manufactured screen chameleon cages, then you'll know what I'm talking about. It's that little plastic piece that's attached to the service door, which stops the door from going too far in on the cage at the bottom of the door. This is one of those things that's not absolutely necessary, but I've always found them useful to have. And all they are is this extruded PVC which is the same material as the plastic floors that you get with those manufactured cages. I had a few extras laying around since I don't really use them for my larger cages and then I just cut those down to size. To assemble the cages, I first drilled all of my pilot holes. For these screws, the number six three quarter inch stainless steel screws, I use a 764 inch drill bit. You could also use number eight three quarter inch screws here. Just make sure that they're three quarter inch. I will say that the number six screws work nicely because once they're screwed into these aluminum frames, the heads of the screws don't overhang the sides of the frame, whereas the number eights will. Getting the cages started can be a bit tricky to get the holes drilled and then the screws screwed in while holding the cage up. It takes a certain amount of finesse. I would suggest using something like some lightweight clamps to hold things together while you use your drill. With the bigger cages that I previously mentioned, I ended up using some corner clamps to hold the cages together while I got the first three sides connected. If you're fortunate enough to have a drill press, using a drill press to drill these holes even prior to screening the frames will make your life a lot easier. But I'm showing you here with the drill to show you that things are possible by hand. Make sure you measure and mark the frame before drilling so that way you can get the screws in the right place. Taking near exact measurements and having each of these screens correctly installed next to one another is extraordinarily vital to having these enclosures come out correctly. Next, I had to put these little door stoppers on the service doors. To do that, I used some green painter's tape to hold them in place while I drilled holes. And then I used some stainless steel number six, three eighth inch screws. And then to attach the service door, I once again used the number six, three quarter inch screws, just like I did on the rest of the enclosure. I did leave these screws slightly loosened so that the door would pivot nice and smoothly. Also, make sure that 
the screws on either side of the service door are approximately the same distance from the bottom or top to make sure that that service door will pivot correctly. For door latches, I'm using these simple plastic picture frame latches. Now these are pretty inexpensive and they work perfectly. To install them, I used a very tiny drill bit, about the smallest drill bit that I could find since those screws were so tiny. For these smaller cages, I just used one on the service door and one on the main door. For the latches on the service door, make sure that they're below the screw that you use to attach the service door to the rest of the enclosure, or else it won't stay shut. For the handles of the service door and the main door, I used some handles I found on Amazon. I searched for hours trying to find a handle that would fit this aluminum frame. If you're interested in these, I'll go ahead and leave a link for them down in the description of this video. To attach them, I made my measurements and then used the same really tiny drill bit to drill pilot holes and then used some quarter inch micro screws to hold them into place. Some of the screws that come with the hardware that you're seeing in this video were too long for the aluminum frame without blowing out the back. So I ended up using these special screws which I also found on Amazon and I will also link in the description of the video. For hinges I used some jewelry box hinges. I believe these were one inch mini hinges which again I found on Amazon and I will link in the description of this video. I attached them the same way with pilot holes. Uh, I found that using some green painters tape to hold them in place made this process very easy. I'll also point out that screwing the hinges onto the door before the enclosure made the door a lot straighter. I was able to line the door up a lot better this way and make sure that it fit perfectly. You could even use a clamp to hold the door straight while you screw it onto the enclosure. Another method I found that made the door a lot straighter was doing the service door second. By doing the service door second, you'll make sure that the main door fits on straight. To minimize the drainage solution, on this rack, I went ahead and made some DIY drainage trays. If you've not watched that video on my channel, then go ahead and watch it. I'll leave a link in the description of the video. Since that first go around of the drainage trays, I've completely improved them and made them super fancy. <laughs> I went ahead and put all the enclosures in place and you can see here how beautiful these turned out. So instead of screening the bottom of the enclosure or using a plastic floor, I just used a screen that is independent of the enclosure that way i have maximum drainage and it was far less expensive than trying to get the same type of plastic floors that are typically in these enclosures alternatively you could use something like corrugated plastic as a floor now that i had these cages built and in place on the rack i could see just where i wanted to place the heat lights for my heat lamps, I used what's called puck lights. Now these are typically found in places like kitchens underneath cabinets. To install these, the light comes apart into two pieces. And one of those pieces has two holes on the inside for screws. So once I get the two pieces removed from one another, I tape the mounted part up into the rack where I want it. This made drilling pilot holes and screwing in screws very easy. I've always used these types of lights on my baby racks and they work out really well. However, I do have to make a couple slight modifications to the way these are set up. The first is by removing the glass on the outside of the light so that the heat can project into the enclosures. 
Next, I go ahead and attach tabletop dimmers and get rid of the transformer that the lights come with. Using tabletop dimmers allows me to very accurately control the amount of heat that is being emitted into each enclosure by using the slider part of the dimmer. I do make sure that that slider is accessible from the front of the rack so that I can adjust the lights as needed. To mount those to the front, I go ahead and use some double-sided mounting tape. One thing I'll mention, which may seem like common sense to you, but I've seen it a lot, is that a lot of people don't realize when they're using LED bulbs, which are light emitting diodes that don't produce any heat. Make sure that you're using either halogen or lights such as my case, xenon bulbs. The ones I like to use are 20 watts. I use a total of four dimmers for this rack. I use one dimmer per shelf, which is six lights per dimmer. One other safety precaution I will suggest is to get a high quality power strip. These typically have a fail safe where if something goes wrong or something shorts, the power strip will turn off. Not that I'm saying anything bad will happen, but you never know and it's always safer to spend the extra money on good equipment than to have something bad happen. If you're using a wire rack system, you can still use these puck lights. Go in and pick up a three inch wide by quarter inch thick board like you see here and cut it to two and a half inch strips. You'll end up mounting one light per strip. Once the light is mounted to the strip, go ahead and drill four large holes in each corner of that strip. And then you'll use some zip ties through those holes to mount the light to the rack. And hopefully this clip gives you enough of an idea of what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, I forgot to record it as I was doing it, so the best I can do for you is just show you what I already have installed. With all that lighting finally out of the way, it was then time to prep the cages for the misting system. I do recommend to prep your cages for the misting system of your choice before you furnish them because doing so afterward makes it very difficult. My workaround with having to spend a lot of money on some Mist King corner wedges was to make some of my own, which I do for a lot of my cages, especially setups where it would cost me a pretty penny to use the name brand corner wedges. For those that don't know, these corner wedges are what the misting heads mount to. I make mine out of corrugated plastic. I do have one extra name brand wedge laying around that I use solely for this purpose, which is using it as a template to cut out the other ones to size out of the corrugated plastic. Once I have all the wedges made, I go ahead and turn the cage on its back and then use little clamps to hold them into place while I screw in the screws. With this part, it's easy to either drill a pilot hole or just apply enough force to get the screws into the metal. I used stainless steel number eight half inch screws for this. Now it's time to furnish these enclosures. This can be very tedious if you're doing a large amount, which is why I suggest keeping it fairly simple here. I like to buy the T-Rex Baby Bio Vine. Buying a bulk amount of 50 feet of this vine costs about $40. And it's really easy to just clip it and then bend it inside the enclosure and attach it using some floral wire. All right, so let me introduce you to one of my new favorite tools. This is a mini miter saw, which I found over at Harbor Freight for about 40 bucks. Now, you don't have to get one of these, but they're so much fun and I really recommend it if you have the money. Uh, it also makes furnishing these enclosures very simple. Whether you're putting dowels or some sort of branch in the enclosure, it makes the process of trimming it to size 
super fast and super easy. And like I said, super fun. The way I attach these dowels inside the cages is by drilling really tiny pilot holes into the end of each and then using the floral wire to attach those dowels through the holes I just drilled. After completing the installation of all the furnishings within the enclosure, I used some wire clippers to trim the tails of that floral wire. There's one last thing I need to do to ready these enclosures for the misting system, and that is poking a hole in the top screen at the wedge where the mister assembly will mount into. To complete that, I used a pair of miniature pliers. Of course, you could use something else like a screwdriver or whatever you have handy. And then I use what's called hat grommets. And these work perfectly with the Dig brand misters, which are found at Home Depot. I choose to use these heads instead of the Miss King ones because they're like a dollar and a half maybe versus 14 or 15 dollars and when needing 24 of them it was a much cheaper option to do it this way i've used these on other racks and know they work and they function well enough to get the job done something i didn't mention before is that the hole in the wedge will depend on what size hat grommet you're using the size i'm using here is 7 16 of an inch with a quarter inch opening for the tubing To give these hat grommets a little bit of extra stability, I use some Gorilla hot glue to mount them into place. The hot glue works really nicely for this application because if I ever need to remove one of the hat grommets, the hot glue is not permanent and can be removed. I found that preparing the connectors and the tubing as one piece before pushing the cages back in was really helpful. I found it much easier to tuck this piece underneath the shelf and then to attach the misting assemblies to it instead of trying to do all that work in a limited space. For my misting system, I chose the ultimate misting system by Mist King. I've always used Mist King and have a number of their pumps, the oldest being about a decade old. With that being said, that's why I decided on this brand. My next step was adding a rainforest shower curtain to the rack. These are a game changer for a couple reasons. The first and most important being that if installed correctly, it will protect all the electrical cords from getting overspray from the misting system. The second is that it acts as a really neat background for all of the enclosures that's fairly inexpensive. It's kind of hard to see what I'm doing here since it was such a tight area to film in, but essentially I'm using some command hooks to hang the shower curtain, and then I'm cutting small holes into it to feed the cords out through. And then all those cords are fed to a power strip that's mounted on top of the rack. There's a few reasons why that power strip is mounted to the top of the rack. The first is to keep it out of the way so I don't roll the rack over it and so that the rack fits flushly up against the wall. The second part, which I had originally not intended on, but it's extraordinarily useful, is the fact that I can keep my fruit fly cultures by it since it generates a lot of heat and heat rises that top area above the rack retains a lot of heat which help these fruit fly cultures produce and bloom quicker than having them in another place that isn't as warm once my background was in place i then inserted plants into each of the enclosures 
I have a plant nursery that's down the street from me where I can get these four inch potted plants for about four bucks a piece. So I highly suggest that you look at a local nursery for lower prices than that of a big box store like Home Depot or Lowe's. On all of my baby enclosures, I use a baby feeder cup holder and I made 24 of these for this rack, which I install here. And finally, it's cam time. Are you ready for an absolute overload of cam cuteness? <laughs> <laughs>
So that's it. I hope it was as detailed as possible and all your questions were answered. I hope that you're inspired to go ahead and create maybe some enclosures of your own or a rack of your own, or maybe take some lighting tips that, you know, I use on this rack for your own rack. So please, if you use the puck lights, the recessed heat lighting that I used in this video, be very cautious with the amount of heat that you're putting in the enclosure. Since those bulbs burn so hot and are so close to the tops of the enclosure, you may harm your reptile, which is why I have each rack or each shelf on a dimmer so that I can control the amount of heat. I also want to go ahead and take a moment to thank everybody that's subscribed to this channel and supported this channel over the last year since I've made it. I went ahead and got 100 subscribers finally on this channel and was able to create a custom URL. And I know that's not a big deal to you, maybe you, but to me, that is a huge deal because I can get rid of that crazy URL with the huge blurb at, after youtube.com. And I, I changed it to youtube.com slash magical cams. So now I can tell people, hey, youtube.com slash magical cams instead of youtube.com slash <laughs> yes, that's exactly how it was spelled. Um, but anyway, thank you again to everybody who's supported my passion for making things for my chameleons. And I hope that I've been as helpful as possible and I've given you ideas to do some wonderful things for your reptiles or your chameleons. If you've not checked out magicalcams.com, I highly suggest you do. Even if it's just a visit to check out the layout or read about the breeders that we have or what have you. I've taken a lot of time to update it and I'm pretty satisfied with it, though there's a few more things I need to do. So if you need something to do and you're at home and just bored, then go ahead and go over to magicalcams.com. And while you're there, if you're interested, you can reserve a chameleon from the smoke Akasha Clutch, which are due about midsummer or fall. If you have any questions about this setup, or you want to see my plans, or you want me to help you with your own plans and the math and everything that goes along with it, then go ahead and reach out. On Instagram, it's at MagicalCams. On Facebook, it's facebook.com slash MagicalCams. And then you can reach out by email, that's MagicalCams at gmail.com. And then go ahead and like and subscribe this video. Good luck on your rack making journey.